Welcome to the stream. And we'll uh, begin with our puja, short puja.
and spends some time checking the channel that we're in, what's flowing through our awareness. And it's not just the haphazard circumstances of the day. We may have to certainly deal with those or reflect on those, but we want to come from the most advantaged condition, which is the open state rather than contracted state. The contracted state, unfortunately, to a greater or lesser degree, is the condition that most people live in. Um, and sometimes it's not intensely painful, but it's extremely self-bound. Self is the character of it, the name of it, characteristic. Um, so without saying we, we don't exist, there's a chitta here, there's a heart here, we return that towards, well, we've just done a puja, celebrating that there's something in awareness that's beyond this self thing. So, you know, that, that definitely arises. But that's a series of programs and conditions that construct that. And fortunately, uh, there's something greater than that. You, you know, this is always the fundamental uh, spiritual um, viewpoint. Uh, and the fact that we can witness the self, self experience as it happens. And we want to actually really take a good, firm stand in that, in this celebration. Bhakti, devotion, reflection, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, whatever that means. It's internal, it's wider state of being, more spacious, open state of being, less driven, less trying to make things work, less involved with history, you know, future, past, timeless values. We drop into that. You know, and keep lifting and placing your attention back into that stream, Dharma stream. What values, what uh, touches the heart, the opened heart. Faith. It's rightly called the open heart because um, certainly it seems to have an effect in this uh, chest region, mm. undefended, and we become much more receptive. We learn to receive, have a place that the nature of the heart is to receive, also to respond. But uh, with this first opening, the emphasis is on finding a place where and a way in which one can open and receive the benevolence, the openness, trust. Present. Safe now. awareness. Resonating with these, this direction until it begins to be felt subtly or strongly in the body. I'm doing the armoring, the nervousness, the contraction in the body. And then we've really begun to link this to uh, 
a powerful source of strength. You can take it just a little step further because once you start to open, naturally many energies begin to move around. Uh, things that have been tight release. So we're using the simple open body, the spine, across the chest and the breathing as uh, that which just brings the body's energies into play in a benevolent calming way it helps to moderate energy formations And a great act of, uh, of uh, spiritual love is to the open state receives the contracted states, all those you know, psychological patterns, emotional energies, self views, just widening and receiving that with a and the spiritual love, which means no contraction, but embracing, receiving, giving space for this stuff to be heard. Uh, 
out. Released. So I <clears throat> said I would be answering some questions tonight and uh, mm, I intend to attempt to do so uh, due to this particular wonderful setup that's beginning, it's been established, I'm able to receive comments and questions and um, even short, almost like interviews where a person speaks what's been happening to them and it's of course it's very enriching. Yeah. Uh, the, and poignant, of course, the trouble, uh, the, you know, the nature of the troubled, troubles that people experience. Uh, um, so <laughs> bear in mind that you, you know, if you have some difficulties, you are by no means alone. <laughs> you yeah. know, by no means alone. So, but tonight, I'm trying to get specific. First of all, I'd just like to introduce say, a few minutes. Um, you know, the sort of saying in meditation, you know, the fundamental um, movement of all true spiritual traditions is to get out of this contracted self mortal state, you know, you know, whether it's God, whatever God, whatever Dhamma cosmos, you move out of this little narrow me thing into something bigger. And that's, that's, that's the basic story in brief, you know, and there's a recognition that, uh, that, that that's possible that our awareness, our consciousness, our mind, our heart, spirit, whatever it is, can, you know, be bigger and or touch into vaster, more benef benevolent and un untrammeled uh, experience than this contracted self experience. And it's contracted because that's, it's narrow. It's, and it's, uh, it's also, you can feel it once you've had some taste of, of, uh, of, um, openness you really notice the difference um, and some of this is just functional in other words we do the mind tends to narrow in order to perform to do things but it becomes almost an it becomes an identity that one lives in that state and almost starts to value oneself and, and name oneself dependent upon how how that state that contracted state is held like sometimes it's power it's successful, it's go-getting, it's goal-oriented, it's got these energies to it. And, uh, and then one becomes that to the point in which, and then, but from that state, we're always in this me, you, me, and what will I be, me, and what was I, me, and I'm this bad, and criticizing ourselves, criticizing others. This is the, these are the features of the contracted state. Um, and in acting, upon that in ways that are, you know, um, confused, um, aggressive, um, judgmental, um, disoriented. I mean, this way we lose orientation with something bigger and finer. And there's always that recognition, yeah, you know, you, you can come back to that, you come back to that. Uh, and the first approach is, say, in the Vedic culture from which the Buddha arose, they later formulated this, you start with the bhakti, which is a sense of 
well, you know, begin to at least recognize uh, the possibility of something bigger than you <laughs> and that it would actually be nice <laughs> and you could open to it. It's not about grabbing, it's about being received by something blessed. Uh, and of course, in, in Buddha Dharma, Buddha's fairly cool about this, but he's saying there is such a thing as right view, there is the good, there is the, there is the enlightened, you know, there, there is mother and father. There's, all these are pointing to qualities that are beyond the contracted self, including goodness is not a personal, you know, personal copyright. We all experience these good energies, uh, benevolent energies and, and difficult energies too. So we open to something that's, that's transpersonal. That's almost the beginning. So you begin with that. And so certainly in, in that culture, you might spend years just doing that. And you couple that with good karma. You know, you start to do work, you serve, you help out, you have a teacher, you serve them, you pay respects to them, you follow their instructions, and you learn skillful actions to do with ethics, do through relationships, it's to do with offering service. So you see, that, that's your fun, that's your basic, that's your fundamental thing. If you get that right and you work on that for a decade or so, you know, then along with that, you can maybe start to get into your body. Next step is hapta, body yoga, right? And it starts to really feel and open the body to all the more subtle energies that go beyond the, the energies of the contracted state, which are often hardened narrow yeah. so you begin to do body work you know, you've got some much more refined body work and of course this is the same same in buddhism you do body work mindfulness of body that's your that's the movement into what we call meditation is mindfulness of body you know, of course and then if they pranayama do breath work and of course in the same in buddhism anapanasati is the pranayama uh, you know I mean, it's very simple but skillful and subtle forms of breath energy can move through the system again taking one out of the residues of the contracted state and now you can do that you know the, the, you know now you're getting rid of that now you can really do jhana you know really absorb and dwell in that and then maybe then knowledge will arise so that's it's that you know that movement you know from and this is kind of seamless, and I'm trying to encourage that in these, these series of talks about, you know, because to meditate in the contracted state tends to obsessive, become obsessive. Uh, meditating becomes a psychological review. You know, when we stay within a contracted state, meditating on my own, you know, and figuring myself out, you know, and then often. Uh, so then you get a sense in which we, Recognize you can't do this with meditation alone. You know? Well, meditation is definitely a very, very crucial part of it, but it rests on something bigger. And often what we're lacking in our modern society is a sense of the bigger thing, you know, because our society is so highly individuated, you know, contracted, and we we've lost the sense of <laughs> benevolent cosmos, we've got rid of all the gods, all the spiritualities, all the spiritual energies are now considered superstitious, uh, bunkum, um, and we're just down to material, you know, materialism, very narrow perspective, you know, uh, and it doesn't do justice to the, the richness of consciousness in which all, all awareness, you know, and, and the and the permeable nature of it, it's not all encased in this, it's something bigger than this. So just put bear in mind, because it's very helpful to be able to see, you know, you can, you don't just start with meditation, but start the right view with getting sila, karma yoga, service, helping others, skillful relationships, work on those. And this is not like you can't have a single, moment of meditation to really do that. But really, if when meditation becomes difficult, then you move back to where there's some skillful karma yoga, let's do some bhakti, let's do some devotion. And you know, meditation is a bit tricky now. Let's get to this, find our foundation, and then it'll come back. Yeah. Very helpful because 
when the mind gets depressed, anxious, frightened, seizes up, and you try to meditate your way through it, it's not so, you know, uh, and particularly if one doesn't have a firm foundation in this sense of acknowledgement of the open state, because we've never really known it, we've never heard it talked about. And why you must reflect upon it and, and chant to it and open to it uh, many times to get a sense this is, this is definitely a real thing. Uh, now, I'd like to touch on the questions, and of course there are quite a few. Um, let's start uh, something. Um, Tony's asking about this, what are called the fetters, and this fetter, which I mean the, the main kind of um, locks of the contracted state, the things that the contracted state is locked by. And the first three of these locks or fetters are personality view, believing one that is limited to somehow living inside this body and that's, that's it. Yeah. Uh, um, a personality view, it's very historical because uh, it, it's, it's commensurate with the history of this body. And, you know, and then uh, co lack of confidence or doubt, one's skeptical, one doesn't know which way to go. We don't really know what's right. We don't have confidence in ourselves. We don't have confidence in, we can't trust. We, so we tend to be controlling or anxious, you know, or, or planning all the time. Uh, always worrying about the future, we lose that sense of innate confidence. And it's not confidence in the person, it's confidence in belonging to a fundamentally benevolent cosmos. And <laughs> I can understand one doesn't feel that because we seem to belong to rather unbenevolent political entities <laughs> instead. So this takes a bit of work, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so this is the second, uh, second fetter and the third fetter is called attachment to sila, sila bhatta paramasa is the term. And this is what the question is about actually, but these all three go together. These three fetters go together. It's personality view, doubt or uncertainty or lack of confidence. And what's often translated as attachment to rites and rituals. Uh, and many times, you know, we're dealing with translate, we're all dealing with translations, and the translations, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they uh, um, I have quite, I have issues with them, <laughs> some of them. They're so sila, first aspect of the word sila means behaviors, right? Behavior something that one does, sort of generally in terms of an ethical quality. One, one, one behaves in a certain range of behaviors. They're marked with uh, mutuality, mutual concern, nonviolence. You know? But these are behaviors, ethical behaviors. Uh, and, um, and then the other aspect is bhatta, which means something one does repeatedly, a system or a duty. We systematize. Okay, I do this on Monday. I've got a particular way of organizing my desk. Uh, I like my house to be arranged in this way. I eat at this time of day. We have systems. We like systems because they make things seem certain. And so human life is generally, in order because we're social creatures, this is very significant. Isn't it? We need to have a common, some common, a common stand of behavior then we, we, can, we can get on. And in some sense, so we're all on the same page with the system. We know which side of the road we're driving on, which, you know, <laughs> so you can look at any system in that way. I think this, this really enlarges the concept beyond rites and rituals, which I honestly feel is a very um, lacking um, translation because it's, it's really limited range. So I call it customs and systems. Um, so, 
And without this, how can we how can we exist as social creatures if we don't have some kind of common ground of either uh, how we're going to do um, community effort together, um, you know, how we're going to work together, same system. Um, and also this is behavior that's appropriate and this one we don't do then we can work together so that's absolutely necessary um, and it's same case for me you know systems and customs but the problem is paramasa paramasa means an, like an unhealthy fixation on them or a fondling or an indulgence um, in that which means really that one, one's lack of confidence in, in the open state causes one to get very, very picky and legalistic about one's customs yeah? and very obsessive um, and compulsive about one's systems, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, right? And we get really obsessed, it's got to be this way, I can't do any other way. And then this is an unhealthy fixation, which, which actually then makes this an attribute of the locked state. Instead of being a gateway to the open condition, yeah, which is means that this is this is the custom, so we'll do this, even if right now I don't feel entirely right with that. I, I trust the custom, yeah, which is that means we're able to use a system, a uh, custom. To come out of my personal idiosyncrasies, you know? and so this is the, certainly the way one uses monastic training. Not all of it's something I really feel absolutely great about, but fundamentally I trust it and say, okay, we're going to do it this way, yeah, and I'll go along with that. That's fine. It's not going to harm me. So I tend to have less and less views and opinions and idiosyncrasies, and I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. So look, it's eight o'clock, we sweep the hall, we do it, you know. It's four o'clock, we do the chanting, you know. <laughs> and then I just, so that's useful because then, you know, the rather than relying, basing it on just this particular personal mode, we go into a communal mode, you know? yeah. And so, uh, so there's something quite joyful about that. The thing itself is so what, but the act of just surrendering to that, if it's done appropriately, is joyful. It tends to openness. But it does the opposite when we say it's got to be. It can only be done this way. You know, we've got to light three candles, not two candles. Um, if they if they do their chanting at seven o'clock, it's too late, or you know. Or, whatever you know um so we always kind of realize where is this going yeah what are the results of it we can get very obsessive and picky or we can say this is just a way to arrive at harmony uh and a way of perhaps of of letting go a bit of, of me and uh and I look at them where, where the holding on occurs and is it possible I could look at that sense of, you know, anxiety or fear or ill will or criticism or she's not doing it the same way as I do or, you know, she's not very good at the system issue, she's kind of slow and pokey, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And no, no, just do the system. Everybody does the system, customs, and you respect them, they're trying to do that. And then there's that sense in welcoming. You know? And this is a healthy use of systems and customs. Customs and systems, however you want to put it. And it gets unhealthy and becomes a fixation. Now, these three fetters work together in that because of this, um, you know, whichever way you look at it, you start with the personality view. If I'm a separate individual, you know, that I, I am the separate individual, and I'm this separate individual decides what's going on. There's no, then the separate individual is always going to be some state of anxiety because I've got to figure out how to get it right. And, and you know, and, and uh, I don't really know. So, uh, so there's a sense of, you know, stress in, in relying upon 
the purely individual mechanisms because sometimes I forget or I'm lost for words or you know or I'm so nervous about getting it right that I make a mistake or I get tyrannical then the harm is lost so one loses one's sense of trust in the cosmos in the open condition in the openness uh, because we've relied upon the, the contracted experience to lead us so you know so this is and of course from that extreme contracted state we get fundamentalist attitudes towards ethics and systems fundamentalist this is right legalistic uh, tyrannical attitudes so these three link together and they all give to the contracted state causes animosity jealousy competition power um, sour energies and everybody suffers with it even the person who is seemingly making it happen is still experiencing pressure and tension so stream entra has broken that they have really got a, a uh, not just a, a thought but some felt experience of an open the open state you know or the the uh the benevolent cosmos or the dhamma you know, you know whichever phrase works for you you know they realize they belong to something a stream that's bigger than their their their, their person you know doesn't mean there isn't any self or any self-experiencing any of those structures but they're seen from a bigger position we then we become someone who witnesses the person and begins to handle the personal forms with some sense of compassion and skill and study and train it because we're bigger than that So this is called the stream entry because they touched into the stream, the stream being the flow of the open awareness, open spirituality, open intelligence, when, the, when our minds open to something bigger than just this personal planning and figuring and thinking and so on. Now the person asked the question, says, well, you know, when I get to this state, should I is it true that any kind of actions are then attachments to rites and rituals? So, no, they're not. Um, um, you know, so, he says, should we let go of all karma? You can't let go of karma like that. Um, uh, <laughs> no, because you're going to keep acting and your mind's going to keep doing something. And so, in fact, you are learning to uh, contemplate. From a wider position so you, then you're actually your karma your actions can be much more skillful and more refined and penetrative because you're not having to work through this incredibly stressful contracted state and so uh, and then the karma of course the most powerful karma is the mind mental karma and then we begin to work on that in meditation to how the mind actually moves in meditation how we learn to train it restrain it relax it lift it incline it open it calm it release it all this is a subtle form of mental karma and that that continues um, in subtler ways through the process of awakening mm. So uh, that's these are topics you can go back to many times. Talk about stream entry and and, uh, it's, um, and so this is just today's um, check in with that those those references. <clears throat> so someone's asking purpose of life. What's the purpose of life? Well. <laughs> life life i guess the the purpose of life is to generate more life uh, that's what it seems to do purpose one purpose one's individual life so what you make of it isn't it i don't think it has a natural purpose 
life doesn't have a natural purpose other than to keep going and, and, and developing. Uh, human life, there is a purpose which is the ending of suffering or the coming out of the contracted state. This is the maturation of the human potential to come out, to arise within this embodiment and to you know, open to, to you know, the Dhamma. Um, that's, that's a purpose that's fulfilling. Most purposes are not as fulfilling as that, like the purpose to become a, a tennis star that's got some fulfillment, but you not get much further than about 35 before that loses its uses and naturally it's stressful. Most purposes are much lesser than the purpose of Dhamma, purification, release. That's, that's the purpose of life that I would recommend. And when you see Dhamma practice is about how you relate to people, how you do your duties, what actions you do, uh, and so forth, then there's no reason why you can't practice it. Practice it when you're sick, practice it when you're busy, practice it when you're unhappy, practice it when you're happy. There's always something that you can do. It's, you know, to, to how do I, you know, open with this, accept the sickness, embrace the sickness, embrace the, the, the struggle, rather than be compressed by it. Learn to be loving, you know, compassionate towards one's, what's happening in someone's mind. This is practice. That's the purpose what we're here for and you can also look at it and say well purpose is to work out your own karma that is whatever is accumulations whatever particular personal characteristics that are manifesting that's your bit yeah um, that's your bit somebody asked a question about recovering from addiction well that's your that's the karma that's your bit of course you're not the only one <laughs> there is addiction. We're all addicted to some degree or another to pleasure, to uh, security, to gain, to happiness, to, you know, we rather like those experiences, we want more of them. Um, so, but then I imagine the person's talking about what we commonly call addiction, such as substances and, you know, and the other. Any addiction, you've got to recognize uh, the ability to just check the action upon it. And then you've got to learn which it certainly needs to be done. And then diverting your energies, your desire into a skillful way. Diverting your desire into a skillful form, like desire to serve, desire to help, desire to look after, desire to you know, through body work, you know, desire to become more healthy and fit, make a point of going out jogging or whatever you do, you know. So you, you turn that desire form to a desire for the skillful. And uh, this doesn't stop, you know, the stream, stream entry is very keen now because they've got a sense of the value of the skillful states, they want they want to get more of it. They want to really bring forth the goodness they, that's there to have this energy running through them. Um, so you keep doing that. And then also to keep recognizing, uh, you know, turning your attention that way and then remembering you're not an addict. Mm. You know, that... Uh, uh, addiction is a kind of grasp demon that gets hold of you, but it's not you. Of course, it sounds like you can get very personal forms to it. So this is where we sense you just get a sense of perspective uh, on that. And uh, a lot of goodwill is needed to clean up the, the mess of addiction. A lot of goodwill is needed, which is just this open receiving non-criticism, non-biting, non-agonizing, just 
This was, you know, when we say we value the sense of, of regret and remorse as something that's not there to punish us, but to say, you know, you're, you are sensitive, um, you're a sensitive being, these things have created problems, but you, you are capable of being harmless and open to that, honest and open to that. So we begin to pick up these themes to repair and rebuild around honesty, integrity, resolve, um, loving kindness. Uh, that's the way you do it. And it takes time. Um, but, you know, the, because of the feverish reach of an addic addictive object is something you've got to meet with a firm, something else you're very keen on. Yeah, so it could be just, well, I want to have a drink or smoke. Let's do some jogging or lift weights or something like that. It's good. not something that refined, but something pretty hands-on you could get into that you could really put yourself into. So it helps just to, to have desire, in, in, but turn it to something that can take you out of the grip of unhealthy desire. Working with depression, and we work with depression, uh, depression, very contracted state, um, uh, no energy, uh, dark, alone, or pointless, meaningless uh, service. It's very helpful, just serve. No matter if it's watering the trees, feeding the dog, uh, helping other humans, you know, serve. Definitely, you don't want to sit and brood in that, you want to put some energy, takes you out of yourself uh, and to, to be experienced that the mind can lift from the rather flattened, um, negative, pointless state, you know, give it something to, to lift to. This is not what we call clinical depression, where it really is a bodily ailment that you need, generally need support by them. You know, medicine or uh, and so forth. Um, good friends, again, really helpful for depression, just someone who can hear you and uh, putting effort into these things. Helping each other. So we don't just go into that kind of totally flattened state. Um, somebody did ask about energy, said that uh, that. Uh, there's not much, you don't see a reference to energy in, in Buddhism. Um, well, of course, energy is an English word. Um, so in Pali text, you have uh, the word virya is energy, but uh, that's generally the energy that you, you apply. You have energy and then you can use it. Um, but it's really a... a, a, a um, I think what the person is referring to is the energy that we talk about, like in Tai Chi or Qi Gong, where you're just feeling certain energies and you can you know, use them uh, in like embodied energies. And this is this is in in the way that the early Buddhists talked about this is um, Kaya Sankara. It's a long word, isn't it? Kaya, body, Sankara, and why you don't see this word energy because it's translated as formation, bodily formation or body formation. And if you take those two words, body formation, and you think, what is that? What is body formation? Is it the shape of your body? No. Uh, and then in the sutra it says, breathing in and out is a bodily, is a bo is a bodily formation breathing in and out. So how is that? What's being referred to here? So just take that word formation and put it to one side. So what actually happens? Yeah, and then it says, you know, another time that's used is say, one has an afflictive bodily formation through which unskillful actions arise. Well, we're talking about things like when I get angry, energy, when I get, um, uh, um, deceptive, you feel what happens to the body. 
So really, this is talking about somatic energy, body energy. And the prana, breath in, in India, as in China and in many other cultures, breath is not just air moving in and out of your lungs, it's also the, the energy that goes along with that, like in pranayama, you can learn to channel energy through breathing. So energy, breath connects to the kaya sankara, the body energy, and soothes it and steadies it. That's, that's the essence of anapanasati. Um, as it, and it's talked about in that way. One is sensitive to the kaya sankara, body energy, and then one soothes it and calms it. And, and then it says, so that the sense of happiness and pleasure saturates the body. There's not one part of one's body that's not saturated with happiness and pleasure. Well, that's not coming from massage. That's coming from the, where does that come from? It's not tactile. It's coming from an energy moving through the body. And this is a kaya sankara. And of course it goes further than that because there's another sankara called chitta sankara, which is the energy of the heart. When the heart gets agitated, when the heart gets uh, violent, when the heart gets uh, depressed, what's happening? The energy goes very intense, doesn't it? When you get pushy, the energy, heart energy gets very tense, or it goes completely flat, or it just spins around in this agitated, scattered way. That's chitta sankara. So fundamental meditation practice, use the kaya sankara to steady the jitta sankara because they're, the energies of, are really running parallel or symbiotic even. When your mind gets intense, your body feels tight. When your body can relax, your mind relaxes, your heart relaxes. When you get angry and upset, you, your body contracts. So basically, what is doing that? That's energy, does that, <laughs> right? And of course, the other form of energy is, is thinking energy. You're getting very thoughtful. And the Buddha says, well, too much thinking gets stressful. It tires the body. How does thinking tire the body? Because the thinking is an energy. And the energy has effect on the body energy. You may say it even arises from the very same source. So there's plenty of energy in Buddhism. It's just it didn't translate it. <laughs> didn't translate the word very well. <laughs> and so getting space in intense situations, someone's talking about, um, uh, you know, being, having quite a difficult time and very busy and also dealing with a, a very old, aged parent and getting very stressed out. And this is where you need to work on those those there's energies, you know, using your body to just keep, keep your feet grounded, open the soles of your feet, open the palms of your hands, feel your spine. Feel the soles of your feet, open the soles of the feet. Feel the spine, hold the spine, use that to open the, you know, open, the, feel the palms of your hands, can you open those? and then draw a line from one palm to the other palm and take a few breaths. So you, you come out of the intense contracted state somatically. That's, that's, that's the quick way. And, uh, uh, you know, then you're not having to constantly try to adjudicate it psychologically because often when you're in that contracted state you don't think very clearly you know your, your psychology is contracted you get into guilt and regret and criticism and hating yourself and not wishing to be this now and the other and you're dealing with all of this stuff but if you get to the fact that the heart energy rests is dependent and connected to the body energy then you go to the body energy and start you know, and then you create space. When, you, when space arises, something, oh, I could, I could see, you know, you see possibilities you didn't see before. 
So very important to cultivate that. Um, someone asked about a reference to four qualities that promote social harmony that I mentioned the other week. I wanted to revisit that. Um, and the references, there's quite a few references in the suttas. It's a fairly, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a common theme. This, the four references: dana, generosity; piyavaja, gentle or harmonious or um, speech; attacharya, atta, no, atta, which is different from atta. Atta means the goal or purpose, meaningful conduct, benevolent service. Um, and some, samana tata, samana is something like even, samana tata, impartiality. Um, you're, so these can be used in different you know, contexts. Um, dana. And here's one reference, so plenty of references to them. Um, long Discourses, um, 30th Sutta, Section 1, Paragraph 16. Numerical Discourses, Book of the Fours, number 32, number 256. Okay, Book of the Fours, 32 and 256, you'll see references to it. Numerical Discourses, Book of the Eights, number 24. Book of the Eights, 24. And this one, I'd like to read you a bit from the Book of the Nines, Sutta 5. And here, you know, again, different ways of using these words. Uh, so here, the uh, translator, what is the power of sustaining a favorable relationship? So this can be seen as either general social harmony you know with in the society or it can be just how us five work together in preparing a meal okay sustaining a favorable relationship okay giving in endearing speech beneficent conduct and impartiality this is the way it's being used in this among gifts, the best is the gift of the Dhamma. So we try to give each other compassion, kindness, honesty, uh, uh, respect. Um, we try to talk and give each other opportunities to come out of the contracted state. We say, you know, oh, that's interesting, you know, rather than you've got to do it this way. You know, you help a person to, to come to something bigger. It's how to work together and in harmony. And so often this is helpful when you're working together. Well, what about you? And what about you? This is what we want to do. And you spend some time actually talking about it. Not too much, hopefully, <laughs> but enough to get people to, to, to so that they, they can enter it with a sense of willingness. So the volunteer comes from the heart. They see the value. Among types of endearing speech, the best, the best is repeatedly teaching the Dhamma to one who's interested in it and listens with eager ears. So one should not teach the Dhamma to people who are not interested <laughs> no, uh, because it's disrespectful to the Dhamma and it just becomes a slogans and platitudes. Yeah. Uh, among types of beneficent conduct, the best is one one encourages, settles and establishes a person without faith in faith. Um, one establishes a person without morality, immorality. One establishes a person who's miserly, we establish them in generosity. And someone who is 
unwise, you establish them in wisdom. This is the highest kind of service. So really, and so we really try to, you know, look at uh, our work as ways in which we encourage. This is the highest. But if you can't get the highest, then you, you know, you get as best you can. Now that there's a sense of, uh, you know, let's work together comfortably rather than aggressively, rather than competitively, rather than deadlines and performance. Let's do this so that, you know, there's a, there's a good quality. We all get some value out of it, you know, for ourselves, not just to get money or get things done, but you know, encourage people to, to in that particular way, to serve. And the types of impartiality, the best is that a stream enter is equal to a stream enter, an arahant to an arahant. Uh, so this is seeing, basically, you know, you respect others as you do yourself. This is one way of looking at it. You see others in the same way as you see yourself. And this is, this is impartial. You know, so maybe there's, when we're sharing something, I think to myself, well, I don't see why I should have it all. Why does not want to give some to her? I'm not the only person here. What about her? But at the same time, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to forget my own welfare. Where does this, how does this work out? The impartial to self and to others. We see self and others as equal participants in this cosmos. Because the cosmos is bigger than me and bigger than you. So we want to make these, how do we fit together? Impartial to see the balance whereby harmonious relationship and both entities are valued, even sharing respect. The other aspect where impartiality is is, is defined as, you know, you, you, you apply yourself with benevolence and goodwill towards people when they're in a good state and when they're in a bad state, you don't give up on people because they were nasty to you. One well, of the qualities of a good friend is they bear with you when you're being a bit rude. When you lose it, you lose your temper, they don't just dump you and they bear with you. And that, so we then, then so, you, so this means that a person begins, oh yes, oh yes, yes, you know, and they value the reliable person and they recognize, yes, I was a bit speaking harshly then. So we give, we give people the extra chance, you know. Now, if you only, if you only can only be with people when they're in a good state, we are not much of a friend, really. So it's got to be impartial. Now, when these occur, there's going to be social cohesion because we welcome and value and give value and conduct ourselves in valuing ways together because this is what benefit it's not like i'm doing you a favor i just i am tuning in to the big picture and the big picture accepted me yeah the dumber accepts me uh, well, i shouldn't accept you <laughs> you know you're here too and uh, uh so this is something I've always sort of had in the back of my mind, you know, that, yeah, somebody helped me out, teacher picked me up and I wasn't in a great shape, I was in great state. Um, they looked after me and they showed me the right way. Well, I'm going to bend down and do that to other people. You know, you should do the same thing. You know, and say, well, that's not to you. <laughs> no, you share it. There's an impartiality, not just through the brilliant students, but also to anybody, um, you know, so this, this is, then it's going to bring people together. And in fact, there isn't this kind of pushing and jostling and who's better, because it doesn't matter who's better. That's their, that's their issue. You know, they think they're better. That's a problem for them. Um, we all are working with our karma. That's what it's, whatever it is, that's what we're working with. There's nobody, you know, <laughs> who's free of that, 
we're all on the same level in that way. I'm working with my stuff, you're working with your stuff. My stuff may look better to you, but you know, you've still got to work with it, attachment. Uh, so this is, uh, and then, and then there's no sense of he's better than me or worse than me, or uh, she's way beneath me or something. So she's working on her stuff, I'm working on my stuff. How can we work together? And then that's uh, in the sense of it just helps. It helps stop identifying with some state of mind, <laughs> either your own or somebody else's. Stop identifying with it. It's just stuff that has to be dealt with in, in the great way of things. And this is the open way of a reviewing experience. Um, Actually, there were more questions. There always are, and there always will be. But I think that's what we're going to cover tonight. So thank you for your questions. I hope some of it's been useful. So we'll uh, sign off for the evening. Hope some of that's been useful and uh, maybe the stream's always around <laughs> if you know where to look, but maybe this particular room will again be available uh, next week and why not? <clears throat> Supati Pano Bhangavado Savaka Sangho Sangam Nama So take care and have a a profitable week. <laughs>